The title of my message today is Pestilence and the Word of God. And I'd like to ask a question. Do you think that God caused this pestilence to punish the world for its disobedience to his way of life? I'm sure it's crossed your mind and it's crossed the people of the world, the peoples of the world. But you know, it's possible, but God didn't have to do that. He could just let sinful man do his thing, like uh, experiment with bats in a Hunan lab, experimenting with coronavirus and bats, or uh, allow uh, wet markets in Hunan to sell exotic uh, foods, meats that uh, have been infected by, by bats, uh, meats that we know that we shouldn't eat, that God tells us are unclean. But whatever is the case, God certainly does have a lot to say about pestilence in the Bible. And he also uses pestilence and plagues to punish uh, nations, even the nation of Israel. And uh, let's just uh, define our terms a little bit. When we say plagues and pestilence, what do we mean? Uh, a plague is a disastrous evil or affliction an epidemic disease causing a high rate of mortality. You probably heard of the bubonic plague, and that was a terrible scourge uh, between 1347 and 1352 in Europe. And they estimate there were about 50 million deaths. So even though it's called the bubonic plague or the Black Death, we could consider that a pestilence Another definition for plague is an, epi an epidemic disease causing a high rate of mortality. And certainly the bubonic plague would fit into that. So we say that a pestilence can be a plague, but not all plagues are pestilence. Now the, uh, a dictionary definition for pestilence is a contagious or infectious epidemic disease that is vir vir virulent which means it's able to overcome the defense mechanisms of the body and it's caused by a pathogen or an infectious agent. And God uses plagues and pestilence, as I said before, to punish nations, including Israel. We all know about Egypt's, the ten plagues that God invoked upon Egypt. Now the plague of the frogs, for example, would not be a pestilence. But if we go to the sixth one, the sixth plague, the plague of boils, uh, you don't have to go there, but Exodus, Exodus 9, verses uh, 8 to 11, the plague of boils where God told uh, Moses and Aaron to take uh, the ashes from a furnace and to throw it into the air, and the dust then became a plague. It became a, 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 a pestilence, and everyone became infected by whatever was in that, in that dust. And of course, we know but it's also important to remember that uh, Goshen, the Israelites in Goshen, this was the sixth plague, they were protected. So, so we have to remember that and uh, be encouraged that God can protect us. He protected Israel in Goshen after the third plague. And um, if we go to the last plague, that certainly was a uh, pestilence, the uh, death of the firstborn. Now, let's think about it. God. God put together a, uh, a, a specific pestilence that would only kill though the firstborn, the firstborn of the Egyptians. And uh, so everyone else was immune. Everyone else was immune. And of course he protected his people through the blood of the lamb that was put on the, on the, on the doorposts so that the, so that the plague went over the people of Goshen. Now, if you turn to Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. Deuteronomy 28, and verse 15, please. God, through Moses, told the people of Israel that if they obeyed him, he would bless them. But he told them that if they did not obey him, that there would be curses. Curses imposed on them. The blessings and curses. Deuteronomy 28. And I just want to emphasize verse... Uh, we have the blessings first for obedience to God. But then in verse 15 it says, 
But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you, and they will overtake you. Verse 21. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. Verse 22. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning, fever, with the sword, with scorching, and with mildew. They will pursue you until you perish. Verse 27. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt, with tumors, with the scab, and with the itch from which you cannot be healed. So, Israel was warned. Israel was warned. But uh, as we know the story, Israel did not obey God. And um, some of these curses fell upon Israel, particularly uh, the curse of pestilence. If you turn to Jeremiah, let's just look at a few instances of uh, God punishing Israel. Uh, Jeremiah 42, or, or telling Israel that they, he, he would be punishing them. Jeremiah 42. Jeremiah 42 and verse 17. Now after, uh, after Israel, after uh, Jerusalem fell, there were those that wanted to uh, flee to Egypt. They didn't want to uh, go with, uh, to Babylon. But it was God's will for the people of Israel, the people of Jerusalem, to go to Babylon. And so God tells them in Jeremiah 42, 17, So it shall be with all the men who set their faces to go to Egypt to dwell there. They shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. And none of them shall remain or escape from the disaster that I will bring upon them. So here, and I'm sure, I'm sure that that happened. We don't have a record in the, because uh, they, did, they did go to Egypt. Um, but I hope uh, uh, Jeremiah was spared. I know Jeremiah would be spared that he went on, as we believed, uh, to other places in, in, in Europe. Uh, because God had a mission for him. You turn to Ezekiel 5 and verse 11, please. Ezekiel 5. Ezekiel 5 and verse 11. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable things and with all your abominations, therefore I will also diminish you. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. One third of you, and I, this is to the people of Jerusalem. Uh, you know, Jerusalem was uh, taken by King Nebuchadnezzar in stages. And um, Ezekiel went in the first stage. And so he's prophesizing here while Jerusalem is still uh, is still there, it hasn't fallen yet. It's a number of years after that until Jerusalem capitulates. Um, and you know, God is warning them because they are not listening to him. And uh, verse 12, one, one third of you shall die of the pestilence and be consumed with famine in your midst. And one third shall fall by the sword all around you. And I will scatter another third to all the winds and I will draw out a sword after them. Thus shall my anger be spent and I will cause my fury to rest upon them. And I will be avenged. And they shall know that I the Lord have spoken it in my zeal when I have spent my fury upon them. God's fury. And one more, uh, 2 Samuel 24, please. 2 Samuel Second Samuel verse 24. And uh, here Satan in inspired uh, da uh, David to number, to number Israel, to take a census of Israel. And for that, God was going to punish him in Second Samuel 24 in verse 13. And uh, David had a choice of three different punishments. So Gad came to David and told him, and he said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or shall you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days plague in your land? Now consider and see what answer I should take back to him who sent me. So David had to choose the punishment. And in verse 14, And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, 
for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent the plague upon Israel. And again, in this case, it was a pestilence. From the morning till the appointed time, from Dan to Bathsheba, 70,000 men of the people died. And when the angel stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, it is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. So 70,000 Israelites died. And to put things in perspective, right now there's 119,000 Americans that have died of this coronavirus. But we see that God is merciful. And he relented. There could have been many, 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 many more killed, but he relented. And he spared Israel from more death. Now, how does that apply to us today? Well, today we, we, uh, we understand that there's the birthright, the birthright blessing that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob passed it on, not to Reuben, his firstborn, because Reuben was disqualified, but he passes it on to Manasseh and Ephraim. If you turn to Genesis 48, please. Genesis 48. Are we under the curses today? Well, yes and no. <laughs> God's people? Um, Genesis 48 and verse 13. Genesis 48. Verse 13. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left hand, Israel's Jacob, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him to get the blessings. Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name, Israel's name, be upon them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So the birthright blessings were passed on to Ephraim and Manasseh. And we teach that uh, Manasseh became the United States, Ephraim became uh, uh, England, and Manasseh became the United States. And uh, the birthright was given to, uh, to, to Ephraim, the younger one. And, uh, but the blessings and the cursings would apply to the birthright. And we know that the 10 lost tribes, or the balance of them, that they settled in Europe, in Europe. And where, where has the plague been, or the pestilence, the coronavirus, where has it been the, the, the most deadly? Well, in the United States, England, and, and Europe. So does it apply to us today? Well, not God's people. Yes, the birthright, so the nations of Israel are under, still under the curse, but God's people, we're under the blood of Jesus Christ. We have the protection of Jesus Christ. We have his blood so that we could go in repentance. And, when, and Jesus Christ was a curse for us. He, 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 he bared our sins on the cross. He bared the curses in, in himself, the curse of the law. And so we don't have to, uh, we're not bound by the, the blessings and the cursings. Of Deuteronomy 28 we could go to God through Jesus Christ and we could have his protection and you know God protected Israel from pestilence he gave Israel warnings about leprosy now leprosy today is called Hansen's disease and it still exists today from what I read it's about 20,000 people or less still get leprosy in the United States, but it's treatable, uh, like AIDS is treatable with a cocktail of, of, of drugs. Um, and leprosy uh, damages the skin and the nerves. 
causing a lack of ability to feel pain in, in most cases. And God, this was seen to be prevalent in, uh, in the Old Covenant, this uh, disease of leprosy. And God provided in his word the law of leprosy in Leviticus 13. He gave them a, po a policy of quarantine in Numbers 5 and verse 2 that they had to be without the camp. They had to until, until they were healed, if they were healed. They could not be with the other people because it was highly contagious. And he gave them a ritual for cleansing in Leviticus 14. And we know that uh, Jesus helped lepers. He healed them in Luke 17, verse 12 through 19. The 10 lepers were healed. In Matthew 8, verses two and three, Jesus healed a leper. Naaman, the general from Syria, was healed of his leprosy through Elijah, Elijah, Elijah. And uh, in Kings 5 and verse 1. And if you turn to uh, 2 Kings 19 and verse 35, sometimes God uses pestilence to protect Israel in the Old Covenant. 2 Kings 19 and verse 35. Second Kings 19 and verse 35. And here uh, the Assyrians were sieging Jerusalem. And uh, th there was uh, a famine problem. And Hezekiah prayed. He prayed to God for help. And in verse 35, And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So it seems that most likely it was a pestilence that killed 185,000 Assyrians dead. And apparently the pestilence then, God took it away so that it wouldn't affect the, uh, the Israelites. If you go to Second Chronicles 7, please, in verse 12, Second Chronicles, God is a merciful God. Second Kings, uh, Second Chronicles 7 and verse 12. And after uh, Solomon built the temple and dedicated it to God, God appeared to Solomon by night in verse 12 and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called my name will humble themselves, that's what we always have to do. We have to humble ourselves before God. And if we pr and pray, if they humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. So if God sent a pestilence and Israel, the Israelites would humble themselves, and they would uh, repent, uh, God would forgive their sin and heal their land. And now Psalm 91, please. Psalm 91. Psalm 91. I think you know where I'm going here. Psalm 91 and verse 5. And this is a prophecy for the end time. For, for the end time. You shall not be afraid, talking to God's people. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side. And those that are alive at the end time, this is gonna happen. A thousand will fall at their sides, maybe by pestilence, but they will not be affected. And 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. 
those who have the mark of the beast. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. So we're going to have protection, who's ever alive at the time of the end. I know I, I won't be there, but uh, I don't think any of you would be there either. But uh, <laughs> sorry. But uh, those that are alive at that time will have protection. For, I believe that we'll, we'll, we'll have protection from the wrath of God. Even if we look at the um, the, four, the fourth horseman, the pale horse in Revelation 6 and verse 8. I believe that God is going to have mercy on his people and that the pestilence is not going to come upon us. But certainly, we're going to be spared from God's wrath. The seven trumpet plagues, the seven bowl plagues, we're going to be spared from that because God's wrath isn't going to be upon his people. God's wrath is going to be on the people who have the mark of the beast. And we know in Revelation, it tell, we know the 144,000 are going to be protected. We know that there's going to be the church in the wilderness that's going to be protected. And by the time of the seven trumpet plagues, God's people will be protected from these plagues and from the pestilence. So we can have protection from plagues and pestilences by the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ, according to the will of God. You know, if we say, well, you know, God isn't going to let God's people die from this pestilence and somebody that we consider God's people dies of the coronavirus, you know, is our faith going to go into, you know, is our faith going to be really struck? No, according to God's will. But we will be protected in, by, uh, from, by the mercy and grace of God. We must pray. We must humble ourselves. And we must seek God's face, as Solomon did. So, during these trying times, let us walk in faith and not fear. Uh, let us not judge others. Maybe somebody's not wearing a mask. We're not social distancing. Let's not judge others. Uh, and let's help us, help, let's help each other get through this, uh, this time. Um, but remember, we are not under the curse of the law, but under the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, our Savior.